do the whole play on Tuesday and Wednesday at 11, and this coming Saturday and Sunday at 6. So if you come on Saturday and Sunday, you get ice cream and cookies afterwards. So anyway, but come out and enjoy them. That's just the very last song, so you got a whole playful song to sing, see before that, okay? You Hope home. you guys can make it. In case you didn't recognize who that was speaking, that's my new girlfriend. <laughs> Few announcements for you today. Uh, of course, we like sheep again. That is Tuesday and Wednesday, 11 o'clock for the matinee, and then on Saturday and Sunday at 6 p.m. And apparently we're bribing you to come with ice cream and cookies, so you have no excuse for not coming now. Uh, this afternoon, Deacon's meeting will be meeting at 4 o'clock in the business conference room. So we'll be having that. Our quarterly business conference will be in two weeks. We will have the reports available to you after today. There were some changes that needed to be made. We'll have those printed out and we'll have them out in the foyer for you. Uh, if there are any other changes that need to be made to that, you can contact the office and then we will certainly get those into the agenda for you. Uh, Sunday Night Ministries will be meeting tonight at 5 p.m., we're winding down. We're down to our last two nights. Uh, we will have this week. Then the following week is the performance. And then the following after that will be the Iwana's family night, which everyone is invited to. But we do ask that you RSVP to Annie and she will get everyone signed up for that. And we'll know exactly how much food to have for you. And uh, enjoying that time of kids being presented with their awards for their hard work during the Iwana season. Uh, Mother's Day tea is going to be coming up and that's being put on by the youth department and that is May 10th and that will be following the worship service. So mothers, uh, either daughters and sons, you can bring your mothers to a mother's tea and they will have a time of enjoyment during that time. So, Dave, you got anything? Nope. Nope, no, no, well, okay. You have anything? No, let's go, let's get going here. I shouldn't have said that. Of course, my son will chime in and say, of course I do, I do. We'll get you later, bud. It is great to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Let's stand together for the call to worship this morning. Reading from the second letter of Peter, chapter one, starting in verse three. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affliction, affection, sorry, not affliction, <laughs> and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the internal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that wisdom will continue to grow as a byproduct of right choices and godly responses as we apply your word to our daily circumstances. And Lord, we ask that you help us make good use of the wisdom that you give us every day. Sometimes our choices may not seem clear, but Lord, we know that you are not the author of confusion. We know that we have an enemy who wants to deceive and confuse us. 
So please instruct us and give us a heart for your wisdom, a growing desire for understanding and insight. We know wise choices will watch over us. They will keep us safe, but they will also fill us with joy. So guide every decision that we make today, Lord, and help us observe lessons from all that you have created. Mm. The truth principles that you have built into this universe. Mm. Let us learn from the wisdom of sowing and reaping. The importance of a strong root system in our life. And Lord, we pray that each practical and spiritual choice that we make will reflect your perfect will. We thank you, Lord, for this day. And we thank you for David and these now who will lead us in our time of worship. Open our hearts and eyes to the truth hmm. so that we may present that to others and so that we might live that truth. And that truth is, Lord, is you love us and you never break your promises. Thank you, Lord, for this day. And we give you all the glory and hmm. praise that is you deserve. Amen. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Shake somebody's hand this morning and let them know that God loves them. Here we go.
Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. How good is that truth? Isn't it great? God loves you. Just for fun, tell somebody God loves you. Tell them. Tell them God loves you. It's good to hear, huh? It's good to hear God loves us. Amen. Now, think about what he's done, what he's doing, what he will do as we continue singing from our hearts. See on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. scripture readings comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14, verse 22 and 23. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year, and before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose, 
to make this name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this day. We thank you for the rains to clear the air and make the, grain, and make the fields whole again. We ask your blessing on our pastors. You spread your word and the tithe and its intended offering. And this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Billy. And I want to thank all the parents who are raising up their children in the way they should go. Thank you for that. It will not return void to you. Trust me on that. Trust him, not me. Don't trust me. <laughs> How many people have I let down already today? I don't know, but a lot of people laughed. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for sharing, Keith. Appreciate it. You're that. welcome. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, we just love you and we praise you. And we thank you that we can spend time with you wherever that garden place in our life is. As Keith leads this first verse. 
like that? Oh, I got to hear this. All right. You were just singing, right? I want you to sing again, all right? Sing the chorus with me. Ready? You ready? All my life you have been faithful. Sing it out. And with that, if you're able, you may be seated. not a whole lot protecting me today. <laughs> Hope that fence holds up. <laughs> I'm going to move this if that's okay with you. I got the okay from Mike. We're okay. Because <laughs> I know you all want to see me, right? <laughs> right. Not even my dog wants that. <sighs> I'm gonna apologize in the beginning here. My eyes have been killing me this morning. I've had a twitch in one eye for a week and now I've got allergies in the other. So if I wink at you, <sighs> I apologize. <clears throat> Last week, <laughs> Jim's already given me eye drops, I love it. I'll look at you when I need them, all right? <laughs> yeah, I will, I will. Last week, we talked about Psalm chapter one and it emphasized God's law. And while Psalm two, where we will be this morning and into next week, 
This particular psalm focuses on prophecy. The first psalm presents the perfect man, the happy man. Uh, the people in Psalm 1 delight in the law. But the people in Psalm 2 defy the law. Psalm 1 begins with the beatitude and Psalm 2 ends with the beatitude. But we won't even get into that until next week. Psalm 1 is never quoted in the New Testament. But you didn't know that. But while Psalm 2 is quoted or alluded to at least at least 18 different times, more than any other psalm. It is a messianic psalm along with, here goes your numbers again, 8, 16, 22, 23, 40, 41, 45, 68, 69, 102, 110, and 118. The test of a Messianic psalm is that it is quoted in the New Testament as referring to Jesus. But this is also a royal psalm, which is referring to the coronation of a king and the rebellion of some vassal nations that hope to gain their freedom. Other royal psalms and I'll go quickly, 18, 20, 21, 45, 72, 89, 101, 110, and 144. And according to Acts chapter 4, verse 25, David wrote this psalm, so it must have grown out of the events described in 2 Samuel. Israel was ruled directly by the Lord through his prophets and judges until the nation asked for a king. And the Lord knew this would happen. And he says, I will make the exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. No, I'm not speaking in a different language. I'm in the King James Version today, just so you know. Okay. I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her and made arrangements for it. Saul was not appointed to establish a dynasty because the king had to come from Judah and Saul was from Benjamin. David was God's choice to establish the dynasty that would eventually bring the Messiah into the world. Both Psalm 2 and 2 Samuel 7 go far beyond David and his successors. For both the covenant and the psalm speak about a covenant and universal kingdom and a throne that is established forever. This can be fulfilled only only in Jesus Christ. The son of David, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. David didn't expect a reply when he asked this question because there is really no reply. It was an expression of astonishment. He says, when you consider all that the Lord has done for the nations, how can they rebel against him? God has provided for their basic needs and saying, sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, 
which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness. He left that in that he did good. And gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. He guided them. He kept them alive and sent them a savior and gave them forgiveness and eternal life. God that made the world all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord. To think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, not like I'm winking today, but he winked at. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness that by man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he has raised him from the dead. And they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling and thou shalt be the beasts of the field. And it goes on and on there. First thing he asks is why do the heathen or the Gentiles rage. And the people, the Jews, imagine a vain thing. The word vain, as it is used here, means empty. It means empty. It means that which has so enraged the Gentiles and has brought mankind together in a great mass movement will never be fulfilled, will never be accomplished. It is an empty, futile thing that has brought mankind together. Well, what was it that they were protesting? What was it? Whom are they against? They were against the Lord and against his anointed. And again, the word anointed means Messiah. And that's what it is in Hebrew. But when the word is brought over into the Greek, into the New Testament, it is Christos. And in English, it is Christ. In the Old Testament, kings were appointed, as were prophets and priests. And Jesus said that the world hated him and would also hate those who followed him. Here is a great worldwide movement that is against God and against Christ. How is this any different than today? How does the Old Testament apply to us now? Because I know a lot of different scholars and preachers and teachers who will not even touch the Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us. Preach the New Testament. That's where knowledge comes from. Sure. Where did that knowledge come from? When did this movement begin? Scripture has the answer. Over in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, when the first persecution broke out against the church, we're told that the apostles Peter and John, and after they had been threatened, returned to the church... To give their report. Acts chapter 4 verse 24. And when they heard that. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And said Lord thou art God. And we need to pause there for just a moment. 
Because this is one of the things the church is not sure about today. Would you agree? Lord, thou art God. Many people are not sure that he is God. They wonder, but the early church had no doubt about it. They were sure that Jesus is God. Today, some people will tell you that things are getting better. While others say they're getting worse. I believe that in some respects, both are correct. Today, the good is growing. But did you know that there were more Bible teaching going out in the period of history of the world? But I want to tell you something. Evil is growing. Evil is growing. There is an opposition against God and Christ today that is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Are you aware that you and I have seen in our lifetime, and those of you who are maybe more advanced in age than I am, but as a nation whose basic philosophy, whose basic political resource is atheism, there has been nothing like that in the past. No nation of the ancient pagan world was atheistic. Did you know that? Not one. Somebody says, I thought they were, but no, they were the opposite. They were polytheistic. They worshiped many gods. None were atheistic. You see, they lived to close to the new beginning that emerged from the flood. No one knew a man who, uh, who knew Adam, basically. And when you are that close to it, when you are exposed to it, you do not deny God. So what's the answer for the common church today? Not having a voice in our society? How do we explain that? Is it being taken away? Pastor Reed, what do you think? Is it being taken away or are we giving it away? We're giving it away. We're giving it away. Now, when you get to the time of David, you meet atheists. And there were a great many atheists about that time. And David labels them, though. He says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The word fool in the Hebrew is insane. Insane. The insane, the, the nutty individual is the one who is the atheist, of course. He may have a doctorate at a university. I'm not talking about myself. Although I can be a fool. See, I'm playing music while we speak. But the Bible says he is insane. It is insane for a man to say there is no God. There is, I believe, as much opposition to Jesus in America as there is in those countries that are holding on to the communist philosophy. I believe that with all my heart, somebody says, wait a minute, I hear a lot of people talk about Jesus and how wonderful Jesus is. Have you ever stopped to think that the Jesus of liberalism, the Jesus the world thinks of, actually never lived? The Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of liberalism are two different individuals. And the Jesus of liberalism never lived at all. May I say to you, my friends, the Jesus the world believes in today doesn't even exist. How can I say that? How can I stand in this pulpit and say the Jesus that they believe does not exist? How is that possible? How could I speak those blasphemous words? There is a tremendous buildup here. A mighty crescendo of opposition against God and against Christ in this day in which we live. 
How does it manifest itself? How does it manifest itself? Exactly as he said it would. Notice again the third verse of our psalm and hear what they are saying. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What are some of the bands God has put on the human family? Marriage is one. God created marriage for the benefit and welfare of mankind. Today, they not only want to get rid of it, they are getting rid of it. I was shocked when I heard on a TV show that there's more people living together who are not married than there are couples who are married. So, somebody may ask, why does a young couple have to get married if they love each other? Why can't they just start living together? God gave marriage and God intends for it to be followed. That's why. But they say, let's break their bands asunder. Also, let's cast away their cords from us. The Ten Commandments are cords. When somebody accuses me of saying that we don't need the Ten Commandments, they are wrong. We are not saved by keeping them. But I will say this, God gave them, and he gave them to protect mankind. They are thrown out the door today, and right now we are experiencing lawlessness in the country because of the fact that crime is not being punished. There has been a terrible loss of lives that would not have occurred had laws been enforced. We are living in a day when the prevailing philosophy is, let us break their bands asunder. Let us cast away the cords from us. We want to be free and do as we please. God says we can't make it that way. It won't work. We've got old evil natures that need to be restrained. But mankind is moving towards getting rid of all constraints today. It is disturbing to look at the world in which we're living. In the political world, there is confusion. In the moral world, there is corruption. In the spiritual sphere, there is compromise and indifference. And in the social sphere, there is comfort. This affluent society never had it so easy. And their goal is to make it even easier. We are living in that kind of day. It is disturbing. And I'll be honest with you. I do worry about it a little. Oh yeah. Maybe that's why my eye is twitching. I don't know. I worry about it. Verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. There is an abrupt change of scenery here. Would you agree? It's dramatic as we are now in the courts of heaven. We will hear the divine reaction to the report of the tumult that is underway here on earth. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. What kind of laughter is this? What kind of laughter is this? I don't think it's the laughter of humor. He's not trying to be funny. There is humor in the Bible. The devil has certainly hit a home run by making people think. <laughs> Christians are a bunch of stuffed shirt, um, no fun having people. 
and that the church is boring. Why should we come? Oh, I'm obligated to sit in the pew every Sunday. Okay. That is boring. I would classify that as boring. But we're not a boring people. We are not a boring people. If this is not the laughter of humor, what is it? We need to see this through God's eyes. Think of a little man running down the aisle, shaking his puny fists in heaven and saying, come on down and fight me, I'm against you. That's how God views the world. We're shaking our fists at him. But what are we doing to change that? As a church, I'd say we're doing nothing to change that. Why? Because we're giving up the voice. We're letting it go. God looks down at this puny little creature. And it's an utterly preposterous scene. It is just too ridiculous for words. He looks down and laughs. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. It is utterly ridiculous, my friends. When little men oppose God, they won't be around for very long. Little man has a brief role to play here on earth. And then his part is over. How ridiculous and preposterous for him to oppose God. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. This is the judgment that is coming upon this earth. And God speaks and acts in burning anger in reaction to man's rebelliousness and pride. God is neither worried nor is he afraid as that puny man rages against him. After all, the greatest rulers here on earth are like grass to be cut down. And the strongest nations are only drops in the bucket. Today, God is not only bringing salvation to individuals, he is also speaking to the nations in his grace and calling them to trust his son. But the day will come when God will speak to them in his wrath and send terrible judgment to this world. If people do not accept God's judgment of themselves and their sins, we know the outcome. What effect will man's opposition have upon God's program? God is going forward with accomplishing his purpose. Period. He will accomplish his purpose. What the little man does not know here is what will deter him, which will detour him and defer him at all. God doesn't see something on Fox News this morning that he didn't already know about. There is nothing that has ever surprised him at all. He is moving forward according to his purpose and plan. He has, and I believe, a two-fold purpose for this world. I think he has a heavenly purpose. And I think he has an earthly purpose. Right now, he's working on that heavenly purpose. The writer of Hebrews expresses his purpose this way. For it became him for whom all things and by whom all Things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. God today is calling out a people to his name. That is his second current purpose. However, God has a second purpose and is stated in verse six, yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. It was God who gave David his throne on Zion. And it was God who gave David victory after victory as he defeated the enemies of Israel. 
But this is only a picture of an even greater coronation. God declares that there is only one legitimate king. And that is his son who is now seated on the throne of glory. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And what is this exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might, and dominion and every man that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all so why do we give our voice away why are we not standing strong? Why do we refuse to take victory in Christ when it is already laid out before us? Jesus Christ is both king and priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but that said unto him, Thou art my son, Today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Why are we silent? What are we waiting for? Because if you need a grand invitation, it's here. It's clearly stated. We have the victory. So why do we act defeated? Why do we come to church every Sunday and then that's it? Why are we not speaking? Why are we not glorifying his name? Why are we not proclaiming the good news? Why? God is going forward today unhesitantly and not deviating and uncompromisingly with his program to establish the throne on which Jesus Christ will set on this earth. He's going to accomplish whether we help or not. But blessed are those who follow him, who believe him, who put their trust in him, who put their faith in him. If the Lord delay his coming, where in the world did that idea come from? Where did that come from? He is not delaying anything. Do we understand that completely? He's not delaying Delaying is, is, oh, I'm waiting for something to change. No, the Lord knows exactly what is going on. He knows why you're sitting there today. He knows. And he lets us know it. Upon my holy hill of Zion refers to a hill on the north side of Jerusalem. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, and on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God has built his fortress here. Do you realize that? We have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to worry about. So if you're hesitant because of maybe past iniquities, the Lord has forgiven you for one. And number two, he has called us to fight. He has called us to fight. We are not going to do this sitting down. 
And no, it's not a grand invitation to stand up and do a jumping jack. If you feel led to, go for it. But what great news we have here. Men may have to wait a long time for the enthronement of Christ over the world, but at least it will seem long from our viewpoint. But it is already a fact in God's purpose. In the realm of the real, there is no other king but Jesus. We have another change in the speaker when we get to verse 7. Verse 7 says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. He says, I will declare the decree. So here's the change. The change of the person speaking gives a dramatic interest to the whole psalm. There can be no doubt that the word I here refers to the Messiah. Refers to the Messiah. The word declare, as it is used here, means that he would now make a statement that would explain of the reason why Yahweh had determined to establish him as king on his holy hill of Zion. The word decree means something decreed, prescribed, or appointed. It is equivalent to a law, statute, or ordinance. Here, it refers not to a law which has to obey, but to an ordinance or statute concerning his reign, to the solemn purpose of Yahweh the Messiah was to set up and to the constitution of his kingdom, the kingdom in which we live in today. Today. This, as the explanation shows, implies these two things. First of all, Christ was to be regarded and acknowledged as his son, or to have that rank and dignity. And the second was that the pagan and the uttermost parts of the earth were to be given him for a possession, or that his reign was to extend all over the world. He has dominion over all. And like I said, we've got more to unpack here. Lots more to unpack. But know this, as we are going to go through this series. This is a series of wisdom. So, if we do not understand this, understand that that is okay. <laughs> we're going to learn this together. And we're going to decree that Jesus Christ is the true and rightful king and that no one on this earth can take that away from him. Amen. And we as a church need to rise up again. Let our voices be heard and allow God to establish his victory. Amen? Amen. Dave. That's right. I enjoy spontaneous applause at God's word. Isn't that good? Let's stand together. Let's, let's encourage each other with this. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. You got the right key. I've been washed in the fountain. <laughs> and one by his blood, we're joined and as we travel this song for a land of the family, the family of God. Heavenly Father, we certainly are a part of your family. And Lord, as we leave here today, I pray that we are encouraged and that we are emboldened to speak the truth to hold fast to that which we believe, to hold fast to which we live, and that is to live in your truth, to live in your kingdom. Lord, let us be ever mindful of the world around us, and let it be a motivation for us not to 
try to evangelize the world, but Lord, maybe evangelize our neighbor, the person next to us, the person we accidentally get into a car accident with, whatever it may be, Lord, you know the situation. You've already planned this out. Lord, I pray that you use us to further that kingdom so that when we stand before you, Lord, and we hear those lovely words, well done, good and faithful servant, we will be beaming with pride knowing that we have followed you, we have loved you, but more importantly, you loved us. Thank you for this day. Bless us as we leave. And to all the activities of this afternoon, I pray that you bless them. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for who you are. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Have a great week.